My name is uh, Jesse Wild, and I'm going to be guiding us through this webinar this morning. So thank you so much for joining us. You just a bit of housekeeping, you should see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A box. And so in which case, if you have any questions as we go through, as we're discussing this topic, please do feel free to pop those questions in there. I'll be able to see them and then hopefully we'll direct them to the right people as we go through the webinar. So thank you so much. Um, joining me today, we have three experts in the field, which is really exciting. We have um, Nick Fulford, who is the CEO and founder of Enhouse, Kai Liebertan, Senior Sustainability Advisor of UK Green Building Council, and we also have Professor Chris Goodyear school, from the School of Architecture, Building and Civil Engineering of Loughborough University. So um, I'm quite looking forward to getting into this, so I won't talk for too long, but I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction um, to this webinar today. So uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jesse Wild, and I am one of the directors of the Bristol Housing Festival. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Bristol Housing Festival was founded back in 2018. Not as a festival, you know, not like a, a weekend festival. Don't think of don't think of it like that, but more with the aim of um, curating innovation in the latest housing solutions to address our cities and our national challenges. Now, we all know, um, and some of us much more acutely than others, that we face a housing crisis. But we also know that we face a climate crisis. Um, and Bristol uh, announced uh, just a couple of years ago an ecological emergency. We now also are facing um, a cost of living crisis, fuel poverty, challenging interest rates. There's definitely a skill shortage in the construction sector. And, and to be honest, the list just keeps going on and keeps going on and paints really quite a bleak picture. Um, but we know that when you have so many of these challenges that overlap, you can't just pick one off and address one in its in its uh, sort of own entirety. We have to think about the fact that these things are overlapping and they all intersect. Um, so today we are privileged to be able to talk about two of those particular crises and how those intersect. Now, I'm sure we will touch on so many of the other ones I've mentioned and others to come, but we are focusing most specifically on two particular of those challenges. One around modern methods of construction and the affordable uh, the housing crisis that I mentioned, but also our climate crisis and our sustainability question. This webinar has come in the, in the context of the recent report that has been launched by the Green um, the Green Alliance, the Circular Construction Report, which a link will go into the chat. So please do take a look at that if you haven't seen it already. I just want to, before I get into the speakers, talk about what Modern Methods of Construction, or commonly known as MMC, really is. Um, it's not actually that modern, even though it's called Modern Methods of Construction. Um, but generally, when MMC is used as a term, it's referring to a construction method where all or part of a house, in this case, is built off-site built in a factory and is precision engineered rather than being built in the traditional way of kind of bricks and blocks in a field. You'll hear loads of different terminology when it comes to MMC, whether it's offsite, i.e. it's built offsite, whether it's modular, which is about modular modules of building homes, whether it's volumetric or you might hear people talking about pre-manufactured value. There's loads of different terminology designed for manufacture that sort of link into this idea of MMC. If you are familiar with that, all those different terms have slightly different angles on this. But if you're not really familiar with um, modern methods of construction, MMC essentially acts as a bit of a catch all phrase for housing, particularly in this case, housing that we're looking at that is being built off site and in a factory. Now, in this discussion, we're going to ask if modern methods of construction or MMC can be the means to increase the availability and the affordability of your homes while simultaneously, and this is where that combination of, of topics comes together, simultaneously decreasing home building's environmental impact. So we're going to try and talk about the benefits and the role that MMC could play in a just transition. We're going to talk about structural barriers faced in scaling up MMC and what, if any, more support might be needed from the government to provide more housing for all that's resilient to the climate challenge. Really, the question is, is it possible to scale up house building in a way that satisfactorily tackles both our housing crisis and our climate crisis. So enough from me, I'm going to introduce the speakers one by one and they are going to come to the virtual stage and answer a couple of questions each before we'll get into the discussion. So first, may I invite Nick Fulford to the virtual stage uh, who is gonna speak on some of the opportunities and potential of MMC. 
Hi, Nick. Hi, Jesse. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, nice. My name is Nick Crawford. I'm the CEO and founder of Enhouse. We are a modular house manufacturer with a real focus on uh, environmentally friendly uh, modular homes. Um, it was interesting what Jesse just said about availability and cost. There are two slightly separate issues facing the world of off-site and MMC at the moment. Um, let's start with the practicalities of really the potential of MMC, um, some of which are well known, some of which are sometimes overlooked. Um, essentially, the concept is that within a factory environment, we can produce better quality homes faster and with less energy and less labor hours. That's because under literally a big roof, we can bring together the materials, the people, the labor, the skills, the trades, create the modules so that they're about 80 to 90% complete. And that means 80% uh, of the house would be complete. We can wrap them, transport them, land them, and then be off site. So why does that help with some of the sustainability and environmental challenges that the UK faces? Um, first of all, it's a lot more efficient in terms of materials. We are seeing a sizable reduction in waste materials that would normally end up in landfill, you know, skips on site that are then going off to landfill, because we can order the parts and the materials to the exact specification, dimensions, sizes, weights, whatever that we require. Secondarily, because we are in an environment that is controlled, the quality is checked much more. It's, I guess, the difference between why you might want your car built in a factory um, rather than in a rainy field over six months. It's all about precision. And that precision allows us to create houses that have incredible thermal qualities. The quality is much better than traditional. And it has to be because we're literally making a module, we're lifting it, we're transporting it, we're lifting it again, we're landing it, and it has to last there for a couple of hundred years. So we are able to reduce materials, reduce the carbon impact by taking quite literally less energy in the construction process. And then because we are undertaking about 80% of the work in a factory, the local impact and local pollution is massively reduced. So around a building, building site, you might see a lot of transportation going on with uh, heavy goods vehicles moving around, damaging infrastructure, polluting, creating congestion, there being a lot of noise pollution, air pollution. That's enormously reduced when you are looking at off-site and modular because we're only on site for maybe three to four weeks after we land the modules. So the, the, the potential of off-site and modular to create environmentally friendly homes is much higher. Additionally, in terms of resourcing, a um, hundred thousand square foot factory facility could normally produce about 300 homes per year. That might be something about 1200 modules. So actually, if you think about the amount of space that that's taking up for the production process, it again creates much less footprint. The other thing about MMC is that the majority of homes that we produce, because they are again being designed in a new way, tend to have certain environmental attributes integrated from day one. So it's very rare that we produce a home now that doesn't have solar, battery, uh, mechanical ventilated heat recovery system, an air source heat pump with water tank. The thermal mass of the actual property, which is part of why we need it to be strong for transportation, creates a real strong thermal envelope it's very high so i don't think we've produced a home that hasn't hit an a rating for epc so that's the the real potential of off-site and modular um, and it's acknowledged by the government they've given us this target of getting from where we're at the moment which is about for sort of maybe four or five thousand homes a year being produced off-site up to something like fifty thousand sixty thousand uh, over the next decade so what are the challenges that stopping this being uh, a real success um, and becoming commonplace? The biggest issue is planning, planning, planning. If you're going to open up a factory tomorrow, you're probably going to be sinking in maybe three to five million pounds. You've got to employ a hundred people. It's a huge capital upfront investment. 
Now, if you're going to do that, you need to know that you've got a pipeline of houses to build in the future. What's happened is that the planning systems become so unpredictable, what will get approved, when will it get approved, that actually factories can't rely on a throughput, a flow of uh, projects, which means that sometimes they have these huge gaps and they're sort of sustaining a lot of cost for labor and factories, uh, factory overhead costs. Now that is makes it sort of, I guess, economically less viable than traditional construction. So if planning is resolved, i.e. it can be predictable and there's more approvals given, then the throughput to the factories is sufficient, the volume is sufficient that the capital investment will come through and there'll be more factories available. I think the second issue, and this is coming back to uh, the point that was made earlier by uh, Jesse, is about price. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer that off-site modular is cheaper than traditional. At the moment, it, it isn't in terms of the actual property that you're paying for, the construction costs. What is cheaper is your costs of time on site, your costs of borrowing, because the actual period that you need to borrow money to do a development is much reduced. So there are those kind of cost ancillary benefits, but until we get mass volume, and I'm talking sort of 25, 30,000 homes a year being produced by MMC, we're not going to see the sort of uh, economies of scale efficiencies that allow the cost per units to be reduced to be more competitive than traditional. So the other, I guess, challenge is the tendering process. Um, there's a lot of young firms like ours out there that didn't exist before 2016, 2018. We're trying to win contracts, big contracts with housing associations, with big developers. Unfortunately, the tendering process, the requirement for framework agreements, the conservativeness of the procurement teams at the larger uh, buyer's end is holding us back. And also, I uh, just sort of final point I would say is that the often those tendering processes tend to have so much specification in them about, for example, the exact nature of the washing machine that's to be procured and provided, that it's sort of stifling innovation. What we would like to see is a, a much wider brief that says achieve environmentally friendly homes at this cost price and then come back and tell us how you do it, rather than here's your very detailed specification, can you do it for this price? Sorry, I've overrun slightly there, Jesse, but uh, I'm, hopefully I'm... I've addressed the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to wrap that up there. But thank you so much, Nick. We have already got a couple of questions popping into the, the Q&A, which is which is great. So we will start to come back to those in the panel discussion in a moment. But thank you so much. So to everybody else, if you do have any more questions to Nick and any of the other speakers, um, please do pop them into the Q&A box. Um, you should see a couple of other questions that are already starting to come up there. So any more questions as we go, please do pop them in there. Wonderful. All right. The next person I'm going to introduce is Chris. So I'm going to welcome Chris to the virtual stage. Hi, Chris. Good morning. And Chris, Thanks. Morning, morning. Chris is going to be speaking on the role that MMC could play in meeting some of our social housing targets that have been set by Homes England and also what's going to be needed to fulfill this kind of potential. So, um, Chris, I'm, I'm going to kick you off with a bit of a question to, to open your comments, but um, the Affordable Homes Programme has set a target to deliver about 25% of housing using modern methods of construction. So my question to you is, do you think that's feasible as a percentage or, or even by setting a target? And what, if it is, additional government support do you think is needed to fulfil this aim? That's how, that's Thanks, Jesse. So, uh, so my, my quick response is we definitely need MMC to increase our supply of, of housing. Uh, the government, I'd say, always likes housing targets. And for decades, going back to the Second World War, has always set itself housing targets. And it's often around 300,000 a year. And we've hardly ever met this target. And hence, we've had an undersupply of housing for, for decades. And the more, the longer we're behind, the further behind we get. So the cynical of me says we'll never reach the target because we never have. Uh, we, but we do need to build homes. They're too expensive and we don't have enough. And we don't have enough in the right place. And I'd say having somewhere decent to live is, 
almost a, a fundamental human right. It's a basic need of a human and a family that we're failing on uh, in this country, which is terrible for, for, for a country that, you know, wants to be a global player where we're failing on one of these fundamental things. Uh, for example, we've got a target of 300,000. I think we supplied about 216,000 a couple of years, I think 243 the year before. So, so we're well behind. There's many reasons why we're behind. Uh, skills crisis is, is a big one. Brexit didn't help here. But even pre-Brexit, again, we've had skills crisis and construction going back to the Second World War. Uh, and we always use it as an excuse not to meet our targets or for problems. Our construction industry never attracted enough of the right people. And we still struggle with it. So, so we need to attract more, more people to, to, to the industry, I think. Uh, another difficulty we have is anyone who watches the uh, property programs knows location, location, location is everything. Or anyone who's bought a house, the location, is it near a school? Is it near where I work? And we have a real imbalance in this country, a vast undersupply uh, in the southeast, even southwest, especially around London. And, and a lot of the north, where I'm from, we, we have an oversupply of houses. There's a lot of empty houses. So it's getting the right houses in, in the right place. Uh, and also, I think another issue we have is New homes, and this is where MMC can help. It's also existing homes. We have a lot of empty homes in this country, again, often in the wrong place. We have a lot of se second homes and holiday homes, often empty, because you can't always be on holiday. And a lot of homes owned by people outside of Britain. So you can go around the large parts of London and there's all empty homes. So we, ha we have homes, but again, wrong place and a lot are empty. But coming back to the topic, we definitely need more housing. And I'd say of all types, so MMC is needed, but not at the expense of traditional. If we're ever to get anywhere near the targets, we need MMC and more of it, and we need traditional delivering uh, as well, and make better use of our old and existing buildings. We need investments, which the government's put some in with, with, uh, with, with this affordable homes programme. But Again, the cynical part of me could say this, this barely touches the size. The, the size of the construction industry and the size of the home building industry is it, colossal. It, it's mammoth and, and, and national, if, if not international. And, and it's been under, there's been underinvestment for decades. I think MMC will help uh, uh, and we, we just covered some of the advantages here, but I think it can deliver higher quality, there's more standardization, it offers opportunity for economies of scale, hence cost efficiencies. Uh, I think it does give more security of demand and supply. If you are wanting to open a factory, you want a, you know, a, a, long, a longer pipeline of orders. It can deliver less waste if done well, but it's not a guarantee. You can still do MMC badly, and MMC is still done badly, uh, but it does give more potential for, for higher quality and, and less waste, and more potential for recycling, circular economy, and, and energy efficiency, and things like this. Uh, and I think also what's important for, for social housing is that due to the kind of standardization, not just delivery, but it's maintaining these homes for, for decades to come. And the more standardization there is, there's more opportunity for maintainability at scale in a cost-effective way by the, by the social landlords or the, or the tenants. Because there's more houses of the same type, the same age. Almost thinking back to the Victorian era when we had uh, terraced houses, Victorian streets that were built in a similar way, the same way, easy to maintain, consistent, uh, and, uh, and opportunities at scale there. So just, just to summarize, I think uh, we, we can attain this target of 25% of MMC. It requires investment by the government and, and more than it's putting in. It requires more labor and more firms and, and more assurance by the government that if, if things change, as in the global economy, national economy, you know, this funding is guaranteed so, so people can open factories and, and supply. Uh, 
but there's big challenges in place, particularly geography and labour and the cost of materials, which have rocketed in, in recent times. Chris, thank you so much. That is that's really good to hear from you. And we will bring you back again for our panel discussion. So hopefully we can pick your brains a little bit more of that. Yes, please. So, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. There are a few more questions coming in on the on the Q&A, which is great. So looking forward to getting into those. Um, but before we do, I'd like to bring to you the stage our um, our final panelist. Um, so Kai, please, will you join me on, on the virtual stage? Kai is going to be speaking on the impact of MMC on workers, um, particularly on the need for the, for the just transition in the built environment sector. So Kai, to kick you off, let me give you a question and then I'll give you five minutes to talk a little bit about your point of view. So one of the um, benefits often claimed for, for MMC is that it increases productivity and reduces labour costs, which is you know something we've touched on a little bit already. But from your perspective, what impact would a shift to MMC have on workers? And therefore, what would a just transition look like if we're going to move to such high percentages of delivery of MMC? Thanks. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, yeah, so MMC has a lot of benefits, and I just want to reiterate a couple of them that we've, some of them we've already heard. It's often just a better system in terms of quality. Um, it makes, from an environmental perspective, it makes um, carbon assessments easy. You have certain products, you can look into the supply chain, you can optimize that um, in a more detailed way. It makes impacts easier to track. It can be more efficient from a resource use perspective. It has less disturbance locally. Um, it can potentially create better working conditions um, for the workers, but that uh, is something that needs to be thought about. And it can bring work to more remote areas if if it's planned that way. Um, but as 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 you can already tell, I'm, I'm using words like it needs to be planned, it needs to be thought about. Um, and especially as we're talking about the housing crisis here, I think if we want to use MMC to deliver on that, we need to be clear about the purpose. Um, and most of the time we just talk about, we need to build more homes, we need to build, build, build. Um, I would argue that the housing crisis is first and foremost a crisis of affordability and availability. So while building houses helps for that, um, I think we need to make sure that if we embrace MMC and deliver all these homes, that that actually leads to more affordable housing for the people who actually need it um, at a reasonable cost, because that's the that's the crisis that we're trying to address with this. So we need to deliver that and just building our 3,000, um, 3, 300,000 houses a year um, with MMC does not necessarily lead to, to, to better outcomes and more affordable homes. Um, and I've actually just yesterday been on a, um, or attended a discussion on that. And someone on, on a panel said um, that MMC leads to superior products and therefore will gain more rental value. And I thought, what does that mean? Gain more rental value? That's a you know quite positive framing for actually rents will go up um, because you deliver high quality housing. Now that's an incentive for a developer, but that's again not really addressing um, the the housing crisis um, because if we talk about the housing crisis, we should look at what are the problems that we're trying to solve rather than what's the financial opportunity for investor here. Um, so I think. I would I would like to see a more nuanced um, approach on this. Um, generally, we have lots of um, empty houses. We have empty office buildings. How can we repurpose that? Um, and yeah, there's just se several other ways um, how you can do this and um, tackle cost of renting directly via regulation, for example, would be another one. Um, and so that was more on the sort of renters um, and affordability side of things. And then coming back to your question again on the um, what does that mean for the for the workforce? Um, we've heard a lot of positive things there already, you know, um, better, better conditions for workers, potentially more stability um, in, in employment. Um, so that can all be positive things, but we also heard about um, it will be more efficient. It could potentially be more cost effective um, and it will be delivered in a shorter period of time. So that means effectively you will have less workforce on site and um, therefore, well, less, less jobs because it's more efficient, right? 
Um, and especially in the construction sector, we have very, well, a lot of small locally um, operating companies and businesses. And I think we need to be quite careful what happens to them. Um, I do see a danger that a focus on MMC leads to market monopolies of construction products that are optimized for price and efficiency only and don't actually deliver a, a just transition for the people who are in the sector at the moment. Um, so, and all of that is not to to, to say that MMC is a, is a bad idea, um, it's quite the opposite. Um, I think it, in a lot of um, ways, it is the superior system um, and therefore we need to embrace it. But we just need to have a plan and I think it needs a political strategy and a direction of travel um, addressing issues such as upskilling of, of workforce, education programs, how do we support or potentially retrain workers who are in that sector at the moment? And what kind of government support could there be for people who would find themselves without a job um, if we go down that MMC transition? Um, so to summarize, I think we should fully embrace MMC, um, but we need to make sure um, that all the, the, the potential issues are being addressed and we need to make sure it makes housing more affordable um, and if there are potential cost savings that they can be seen by the people who actually are in need of housing and address all of these issues just a bit more strategically and a bit more thoughtfully. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kai. Thank you. Thank you to all us because that's been um, brilliant and great to kind of get some beginning thoughts before we now join back together for our panel. So can I invite all of the three speakers to join me again, to turn on your cameras and join the virtual stage? And we have quite a few questions. There have been a lot coming through in the Q&A and quite a few are very specifically around MMC and and getting into the details of what MMC is, how it works, how it sits with the market and that kind of thing. There's a there's a good one in there around um, insurance and things like that, rates, um, and also some good things around post-occupancy evaluation. Um, now, some of our speakers have already started typing some answers to some questions, so do keep an eye on the box. If you've asked a question, you may already have a response. Um, but as a chair, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask a couple of my own questions before we get into some of the, the Q&A that are already, already added to the box. And um, please do keep, keep adding your questions as we go. So for starters, I want to throw this open to everybody, um, but very specifically, the this, this webinar is about MMC and is it the answer to some of both our, our housing crisis, but also our climate crisis. So very specifically, I want to ask, is it? Is MMC going to solve our problems? Is it going to solve our housing crisis? And is it going to solve our climate crisis? There's quite a lot of chat sometimes about MMC being this sort of silver bullet. And then there's also loads of loads of companies, MMC companies that go bust, that fall over, or we hear bad things about different, uh, different companies out there. So is it really going to answer any of our problems or is it all just hype and it's just a fad and it's all just going to go away? So I'll take any sort of answer from, from anyone, perhaps... Perhaps Nick, we can come to you first and then... Yeah, I'm actually speaking to you at the moment from UK Construction Week and last night there was an event called the Offsite Alliance event where a lot of manufacturers and companies within the MMC space come together. We were talking about the fact that, yes, there are firms that have fallen over in the last sort of two years. Um, and the naysayers who are, I guess, are a little bit cynical about off-site sort of point to that and go, see, it's all hype, it doesn't work. I guess what I would say back to that is, if you think about any early evolving industry, whether that is the internet, dot-com firms or automotive, there does tend to be quite a high churn as companies at the beginning of the process are sort of finding their way and, and figuring it out. And that sort of dynamic marketplace where companies do unfortunately collapse, but then re-emerge or new companies are formed and there's a lot more companies being formed and going bust that whole process is creating that innov innovation and that desire to improve so i i can't see mmc going away in fact if anything there is hundreds of millions if not billions of pounds waiting to come into the marketplace to pay for more factories once those structural issues i mentioned earlier such as planning and pipeline and you know those kind of issues are resolved so the answer I think to your question Jesse or what I would say is 
what's the alternative? Can traditional deliver enough homes? No, never has, particularly when it's controlled by 20 large major house builders. Can traditional deliver the environmental changes that we need? Again, those 20 large house builders are focused on margin, they're focused on profitability, and it costs more to be more environmentally friendly. So I'm obviously going to advocate and say MMC is the only solution. Yeah, no, I think this is really interesting. So um, Nick, thank you for that. I think there is a there's a real question there, isn't there, around like how do we change? Actually, how how do we ask the question around what does it look for system change? We have operated when it comes to house building for a long, long time in a certain way. Modern methods of construction, as I said at the beginning, is not necessarily new, but in the UK, it's definitely an, an immature market that is that is growing. Um, so I think I think there's some interesting questions here. Chris, did you want to come in there? I saw you sort of yeah, wait. Yeah, please. I, I fully agree with Nick that. MMC is here to stay. Uh, it, it's a technological development uh, that, that is helping most of construction move forwards. And, and once you've got these techniques, you, you don't give them up, uh, like, like in all asset uh, facets of our life. I think, uh, will MMC address the climate challenge? No, uh, it's such a big challenge. Uh, our whole lives contribute to climate change. Uh, and we, we need to move forward in all areas of our lives to even touch the sides on that one, I think. I think we're talking about MMC and new homes at the moment, uh, which is a great challenge, but whatever we do in this area is dwarfed by the tens of millions of existing homes that are really uninsulated, leaky, and poor condition. And the, this government and previous governments have never grasp the nettle on that and invested enough to, to insulate them and bring them up to a standard that will pay back for generations to come for people's lives and health and energy efficiency. So the government needs to address that. But I think that's that, that's another issue. But MMC, we're talking about new homes. MMC will deliver better quality homes. But I also agree with Nick that the, 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 the housing supply is dominated by developers. And I call them developers, not builders, because the building house bit is of less of interest for them. Really, they, they want like buying land and occasionally putting a house on and selling it when the price is really high. And they're interested in making money, which in a way is fine. We all have a job to make some money. We need to pay the bills. But the way the UK is structured, and we allow it to be structured, is that these massive players hold on to the good land where we could be building houses. Uh, and only sell houses and build them when the time's right to keep that price high. Supply is, is basic economic supply and demand, keep the price high. They, they, in a way, don't really want a factory that can supply a lot of good houses quickly. Then the price plummets in that locality. It is all about local economics as well. And they want to keep, they want to restrict, restrict supply, really. So I think until the government you know, addresses that, We'll, we'll never meet our targets and never give people like Nick the opportunity to challenge the, the big players. I do think this is really interesting. Um, and Chris, thank you so much for that. Because I think one of the things that we've noticed at MMC is that there is, it, it, it is a different business model, isn't it? Like particularly when you are the owner of a factory, your business model is about building houses and producing houses and getting kind of the factory turnover of the houses. Yeah being built and then shipped out as opposed to some as you say that actually a lot of the sort of the the profit margin and the business is built on land uplift that's in, right yeah so we, we, we often get distracted by the technology because the technology is exciting it's interesting and you see the pictures and you say well that, that, that's really good and interesting but really it's it's the business model we we, we do the technology to, or they do to, to make money uh, and it's a, the technology is an enabler, but re really, it's yeah, like you said, the land banks, the planning, uh, the, the economics that, that is the driver, uh, yeah, rather keep, than the actual keep us technology. Moving. If that's all right, just because I want to make sure that we absolutely stay on topic in terms of kind of this crossover between MMC as a technology for house building and um, the, the climate crisis. And Kai, I was hoping I could bring you in here because one of the things that you also raised, Chris, was around kind of retrofit. 
Um, we've obviously set, set up this webinar looking specifically as is MMC going to be the answer to both our, our housing crisis and our climate crisis. But but there are other things that we could look at to solve our climate crisis, particularly when it comes to housing and homes. So, Kai, it is is MMC the right thing that we should be focusing on when it comes to solving the climate crisis or should we be looking at retrofit? And, and if we are, how do we also solve our housing crisis at the same time? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the way you put it there, should we focus on MMC or retrofit? I mean, that's um, quite a comparison. I mean, I, I would say the majority of our housing is existing. So focus on that. That's where we have invested our resources in and our carbon emissions. They are already they're already there. We have that. So we need to use that. And that should be our priority. Um, retrofitting first and making livable homes there. And MMC can have something to offer there as well. It's not it's not only for the um, for the new built market. Um, a lot of it is, but not only. Um, so I think definitely a focus on um, making livable homes in in, in the retrofit sector. Um, other than that, MMC can um, have positive effects um, or impacts on on the environment and on, on our carbon emissions. I said it in my introduction statement, um, it's just a lot more of a controlled environment. So um, you can you can have long standing relationships with suppliers, you can really dig into the supply chain, and find the issues, drive the carbon down, drive your ecological impacts down, and come up with a more sustainable product in the in the long run that is that that is stable in its in its sustainability. Um, so in that sense, I think, as with pretty much everything, it's not an either or question. It's it's about let's do this and the other thing as well. Um, but I personally will say the focus should be on on retrofit. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks. Jesse, can I just add a, a point yeah. to that? A little a live case study or a live example. MMC is only really touching the edge of the iceberg when it comes to the potential for environmental improvement. For example, modular offsite lends itself really well to using a completely innovative foundation solution. We would like to be installing ground screws, giant screws, upon which we can land the modules. That means we're not having to pour concrete for the foundations. These screws act as the foundations. It means that we're not having to remove lots of soil and spoil the ecology is left in the ground. Everybody agrees it's a great idea. Technically, it's possible. The products exist. So why are we not doing it? It's because of accreditation. It's because of the, should we say, the large warranty providers, the building control providers, very much saying, well, that sounds fantastic, but um, if you could just come back in 10 years time when you've done enough investigation, testing, spent all that money to prove that it works. Well, we know it works. It's been working overseas, but there's a sort of sluggishness in the industry that's stopping us embracing those kind of new technologies. A little bit like insulation. We'd love to be using cork from Portugal. It's a fantastic product. Could we get it through a warranty provider? Could we get building control with it? No. So there's all these products that are out there that we'd love to be integrating into our homes to make them more recycled, more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. But we're sort of dealing with the dead, you know, hand heavy hand of regulation that's stopping that from happening. I think I think this is really interesting, um, Nick. Thank you so much for that because um, uh, you know going back, to, I, I know I keep doing this, but going back to the question of this webinar, you know, is modern methods of construction the future for sustainable housing? I mentioned at the beginning that while MMC is not a new industry, it is relatively immature in this country. And uh, a lot of the work that, that my, my role within the housing festival we get up to is, is doing a lot of kind of educating, particularly within the planning center sec sector, within business, building control, within kind of there was questions about warranty and insurance with, with banks even to kind of go, look, this is what MMC is. This is when you're building houses with MMC, it doesn't necessarily in some cases, it's a better quality product. It's just that the traditional build that you know, you know it. It's the sort of, you get into the kind of better the devil you know. Well, at least I know what the flaws of that are. This I need, I don't know. So there needs to be more investigation. But that is necessarily part of the process of, of embedding a, a, an MMC industry in this country. Now, I'm just picking up a, on a, a couple of the questions that are in the chat. There are a lot of questions around the, the sort of the technicalities of MMC, how it works or doesn't work. 
um, uh, you know, how it is engaging with the, in with the with the wider industry or not. And I may not get to all of those because I do want to make sure that we stay on topic. But Nick, perhaps you could have a particular look through those, perhaps even after the session and make sure that we've, we, we between us, we can get answers to everyone. Um, but there's one here from um, uh, one of our, our guests, Libby, and she says, we've heard that because of all the glue that's needed to make modules strong enough to withstand transport vibrations on the way from the factory to the housing site, they can be very difficult to recycle at the end of life. So what can be done to ensure modules can be reused or recycled at the end of their first life? And it may be that we um, answer this question directly, but I almost wanted to use this question, Libby, if you'll forgive me for um, twisting your question slightly. But there is a bigger question here. Um, a lot of times we talk about uh, the houses that already exist and retrofit because they're sort of the the, the carbon that is it, the sort of in use carbon, the house being used. And we've got a problem here because they're not insulated. And we've also got a question about construction carbon. But we also have an end of life question around what do we do with with buildings once they've completed? So I don't know, um, perhaps, Kai, you want to come in initially to kind of talk about that, where where MMC fits into that and what benefits it can have. And, and again, we talk a little bit about the comparisons with the kind of current buildings that exist and the new buildings that are needed but then perhaps we could draw on you Nick and Chris uh, to kind of fill that out slightly but Kai did you want to comment on that question first? Yes happy to um so I think in terms of the end of life scenario of materials there is there is a good opportunity for for MMC um I think as with all sort of circular economy approaches we should focus on um, wherever we can, not gluing things together and not, not, not having connections that are not reversible, so prioritizing reversible connections. Um, but if we do that, I think MMC does really offer a good opportunity because a lot of it comes with standardization and it's factory made, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's made to clear specifications. And if it's, if it's then built with reversible connections, you can easily take it apart and build it new from scratch. Um, with the focus on retrofit and the existing housing stock, there's a lot of conversation at the moment on reusing materials and building components. Now, in a traditional sense, that can be quite tricky, um, not impossible, but it's just it's just a very bespoke process because you need to deconstruct a building that hasn't necessarily been made to be able to be deconstructed. And a lot of the measurements and sizes um, of, of the stuff that you have in there is, is bespoke. So you need to find a way of incorporating that into a new building design. If you have standard standardization and modern methods of construction, that's that's a lot easier because you can say, look, look, this is this is a certain dimension of this product, and I can use that and, and it's, it's, it's sort of known from the start. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it offers some great opportunities. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And, and Nick, did you want to sort of come in on that as well? I, I think it's really interesting how people talk about end of life. It's almost like we've still got that sort of 1950s to 1970s architectural idea that buildings are temporary, kind of Corbusian concrete that gets popped up and then we'll we'll build again, which is very different from the Victorians and the Edwardians and the Georgians before them who were sort of building to last. And you know, you talk to people who work on a lot of traditional new builds and they say, I'd be surprised that this is still here in 40 years. Um, I think the answer is to build buildings that are going to last as long as possible and be used again and again and again. So, you know, we set out to, with our design brief, that although we have to do a minimum of 60 years for a structural warranty, it should be there for 250 years, if not longer, if it's looked after and treated. I, what will people be doing with materials then in 250 years and how they will be recycling them? I don't know, but I think the answer is not to see buildings as temporary, but to create buildings that are going to last an awfully long time and create those homes that people want, rather than that sort of mentality of saying, oh, we'll put it up for a couple of decades and then we'll replace it with something else. Yeah, I really, I really like this attitude, um, Nick. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah. I I, I, I'd agree with Nick there. I think uh, my house, for example, is 1937. It's a traditional brick semi, uh, and I want it to last, yeah, 250 years. I don't want to buy a new one next year. Uh, and so, but I think there's a there's a impression that you can recycle traditional easily. Mine's brick. It's very hard to recycle brick efficiently. It's very labour intensive to take the mortar off. There's definitely a quality control issue. And it's, it's, it's very difficult and expensive. 
Uh, there is a more opportunity with the right form of MMC to recycle much of the material or some of it. But also o- over decades, we, we, we bash our houses around and, and there's many, you know, we put plaster on the wall that doesn't have recycling and we make big changes. Uh, but like Nick, Nick says, in the future, we'll have some pretty advanced ways of recycling some of our material. But I think it's important to, Nick mentioned lo- longevity, making them robust. And there are some MMC techniques, I think, more robust uh, than others. Uh, and also adaptability is important that you, you need to think about. And again, some MMC can be more adaptable than traditional, but some can be less adaptable because we don't really know how we might be living in several generations time. So, and then linking to Kai's point about connectivity of components, think about how might we adapt. We aren't messing around with our homes in this country. How might I put an extension on in the future, How in the roof or at the back? Is that thought in to the design? Yeah, I think I think this is really interesting. And, and, can, and can I just come in here, just one one quick point to make? Um, when we talk about end of life and all of these these things, um, we, um, in, including myself, we've mainly talked about what could be possible technically. But I think there's another component that we need to look at, which is the infrastructure that comes with that. Sort of, it, it's one thing whether I can take something apart and reuse it in the future. Um, with like, how does that actually work? And we we have this issue in our industry in, in, in a lot of ways already. Um, when something that's technically reusable, something that's technically recyclable, but where do you put it? Who who's taking care of that? Um, who's who's handling that whole process? How do we make sure it goes back to the factory or another factory that is equipped to do the whole thing? So I think if we t- if we talk about modern methods for construction in in, in relation to circular economy. We need to think it through across the entire life cycle, including all of this infrastructure. How does it technically and or, or practically even work on the ground? And I, I think that's really key because oftentimes we talk about things that, you know, in theory, great, they're technically recyclable, like you say, but actually we've got no way of doing it. You know, there's a I, I went to a, a restaurant that was claiming to be fully circular at one stage and there, there was cutlery there that was technically recyclable, but there was no there was no recyclable recycling center for that cutlery it, it, for, for miles and miles and miles. So actually it kind of it kind of sort of under, undid its own good work in that sense. And, and the same will apply. I don't want to get into this, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, when it comes to waste, even and waste creation of building of new homes, particularly with MMC, because it is pre- precision manufactured, we can reduce waste by huge amounts when looking at um, building with MMC as opposed to building in a very traditional way. Um, but Chris, I wanted to come back to you specifically. There's a question here around post-occupancy um, evaluation and post-occupancy performance data um, and the question is actually directed to Nick around Enhouse and and what do you do to uh, to do that kind of post occupancy and how do you measure Enhouse's data to prove that it's performing that it is energy efficient and airtight and all the rest of it and I'll come to you in a moment but more broadly Chris I'd like to talk sort of pose the question to you on a more broader scale so talking about kind of how how is the academic sector kind of getting involved in this how do we make sure that actually that there's a there's a consistent consistent performance metric that we're all measuring against that there's even a consistent language around what we mean by uh energy efficient and and carbon zero and all that kind of stuff and particularly when it comes to this issue around housing and climate change the 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 terminology sometimes is used interchangeably to mean different things how do we how do we move that conversation forward so we can start talking with consistency very good question. I, I, I'll, I'll comment on it. I'm not sure I've got the answer. Maybe, maybe Nick does. I think it is a real challenge, but both for existing housing and new, new housing, uh, partly due to all the different types. You know, there's a multitude of MMC. The, the government has seven different categories. Even things like 3D printing comes under MMC. But really, I think we're, we're, we're talking about volumetric and, and flat panel, but still there's many different types of materials. Someone's posted a question about engineered timber, uh, steel, light gauge frame, uh, and many re- other recyclable materials. So it's very hard to, to get consistent me- metrics and very hard to compare eggs with eggs. And there's, there's no real independent authority of comparing these different systems. So you're often reliant on the supplier themselves who, who are, are, are biased to their system, uh, as, as we all are. 
so and and I think it's very hard for clients, whether you're a self builder, independent, or 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 even a social landlord, to 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 understand you know the different supplies in the market and get help with comparing those different types of buildings. Uh, I, I'd find that a challenge and. I would probably say it's, it's holding clients back slightly, hence they revert to what they know, which is traditional. I understand that uh, it's less risky. They don't like risk, which I think we've mentioned before. So I think it's holding the sector back. And I, I, I yeah, I find it hard to answer how they do it myself. I think that's... Maybe Nick can have it. It's, it's, it's difficult to answer that question. But Nick, the question originally was sort of directed at you and at N House and what, what you're doing specifically to look at kind of performance metrics. So did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I very much agree with Chris. It's a complete mixed bag at the moment as to how we um, look at the measurements, the metrics in order to judge the sustainability and environmentally friendliness of what we do. Obviously, there are some more well-known uh, sort of benchmarks like EPC ratings but for example if we elect to use only solar powered solar powered plant on site how does that how is that represented within the environmental friendliness of the house if we can get ground screws rather than concrete for foundations again how is that measured um, as Chris says, there needs to be an independent body that is looking beyond just energy efficiency and looking at a whole range of uh, approaches that can be used to be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly and almost awarding a point system against those and having an education process so that people can understand what's important. So uh, here at Construction Week at the moment, there is some, I guess, promotion of by REBA of um, carbon emissions and a kind of carbon emissions score for buildings that's starting to be promoted, which I think is a really interesting direction. Um, what do we do? We do what we can. Obviously, we hand the houses over to developers or customers, so they don't really want us crawling around their homes all the time, sort of measuring everything. But, you know, we obviously measure all the air tightness. We audit the, the supply chain. We basically pick the green choice where we can, but in terms of being able to then turn around and say, ah, oh, the data of us, you know, doing sort of 25 percent less waste materials and therefore the benefit is x it's, it's really hard to determine it's really hard to communicate that in an understandable format thanks nick appreciate you um answering that question so so honestly um the i'm aware of time and we are starting to wrap up and there are a, a ton of questions we haven't got to yet but i just want to pick out one to come to just you know to sort of our final sort of topic for conversation really um and there's a question in there around um planning and nick you were very very clear that planning was your sort of top priority of things that need to shift in in regards to bringing mmc forward um and you say that kind of the, so there's the there's the idea of planning there's also a bit of a lack of demand in there that i think chris you mentioned right at the beginning um but there is also issues around risk aversion, um, bespoke nature of so many specific developments and the need for bespoke kind of components or parts or or angles or things, depending on the size of the site or what have you. Um, there is a there is a quite a rightly this this question asker is kind of put that there's a bit of conservative nature in the industry. We like to do things the way that we've always known how to do them. We're not necessarily always at the forefront of innovation. Um, so how how do we solve all of these issues to get MMC moving forward and, and not just sort of focus on one at the, uh, without focusing on the others? Or is it a case that we need to pick off one at a time and just, you know, hammer on at the planning thing until that's fixed and then worry about the next biggest issue? Um, Nick, I don't know whether you wanted to comment on that first, but then perhaps Chris and Kai, you could you could kind of comment on what you think are the, the biggest challenges and, and <laughs> the priority order for tackling them. So, I mean, the, the interesting thing when you think about planning is when you compare it to other marketplaces. So you basically got huge amounts of demand for housing. I mean, it's obviously huge, massive. Lots of people want homes and, and houses. There's a large industry ready to supply that. What's what's stopping that from connecting together and 
solving it collectively is you know planning and building control and why do we need that and want that because we want to protect the countryside and we're also fearful of, of poor quality housing uh, developments in the wrong place and the infrastructure that comes with that and i think what's happened is that the planners between the two have become so heavy-handed so involved so i guess driven by a sort of nimby agenda that it's it's stalled and stopped the marketplace from operating efficiently and as it should do so it's left us in a situation where you need to be a big house builder to to really make reap those profits because you've got to have the weight to to i guess push your way through the planning system and it's so sad to see that the number of sme builders in the uk in the last few decades has plummeted down to a couple of thousand because they can't work with the uk planning system so there's no doubt it needs reforming, completely changing, moving away from NIMBYism to a sort of, I guess, a wider view. Um, as to what you just said, Jesse, about whether there is a kind of one bullet to solve all the problems, I don't think so. I think we just need to keep tackling them all one by one. You know, we'll get the, the finance sorted, we'll then get the payment terms sorted, we'll get the housing associations on board, we'll get the planning sorted, we'll try and break some monopolies, we'll you know, challenge the industry, and then all those things over time will move forward and and hopefully result in a vibrant MMC market that's delivering the homes that we desperately need. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Chris or Kai, did you want to comment on that? Um, just briefly, as I'm aware, I'm very aware of time. Yeah, please. I, I, I agree with Nick that the government can free up the planning system more. I think, as I said at the start, you know, affordable housing in the right place of good quality is a fundamental need, social need. Uh, and we actually only build on a few percent of the UK. We we do actually have quite a lot of land, a lot of it's in the wrong place, uh, and it's balanced with sustainability, but we do need homes for people. We need investment in social housing that we used to have until Thatcher, I'd say it was Thatcher. The government needs to lead by example and invest and, and provide people like Nick economies of scale and guarantees of, of, of demand for years to come, and, and then business will follow if that is there. And probably, uh, probably I'll say frameworks and collaboration. So, so companies coming together again, security of demand matched up with with the security of supply. Brilliant, thanks, Chris. I'm going to cut you off there. Hi, is there any sort of final ten second of comments you wanted to make? Um, yeah, just that. I mean, there, there's a lot of pressure on, on local authorities, and there are a lot of solutions to a lot of problems. So I don't think we need to focus on MMC as, as the thing that local authorities need to deliver now. You know, they, they need to make sure that they deliver the outcomes that they want to see. Um, and MMC is one solution of many. So I'd say they, they should just have an open mind to looking at the different solutions. And at the same time, it's a matter of capacity building um, to, to ramp up MMC um, and, and, until we are at a point where we can actually require something like that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us today. And thank you so much to our three speakers, to Kai, to Nick and to Chris. Really appreciate your time to talk to me today about all of this. And thank you so much for the amazing number of questions that have come through. Um, I'm going to call it there, but hopefully if you haven't had your question answered uh, in the panel session, we will try and come back to you. One of us or one of the um, members of the team from the Green Alliance will come back to you with either some more information or a way to get your question answered but thank you so much for joining us today and do take a look at the report that this webinar has come out of the circular and um, circular construction report and the link is in the chat have a great afternoon thank you everybody bye bye